my name is Eva Monson, and I am a assistant professor at the University of Sherbrooke uh, here in uh, Longay, so at the Longay campus. And um, I just wanted to start out by saying how excited I am to be here today to talk about this. It's been a long time <laughs> since I've since I've gotten to talk about uh, uh, this work and. Um, it was a really big part of my life for, for quite a long time. So I, uh, I just wanted to, to acknowledge and, and say thank you so much for, for having me. Um, I wanted to, to also say that uh, I'm just gonna talk about some results from my master's, uh, my PhD, and if we have time from my postdoc, given the time constraints, there's no way we don't have time for that. Um, but Given everything that I just said, you might be able to tell that I was a bit of a, a Zepsum stan, you might say, back in the day. Um, and today I'm just really excited because this is a bit of a, a walk down uh, memory lane for me, <laughs> you could say. And um, and uh, and we're gonna kind of go through all of that together. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, my time with the Zepsum project was for everybody who's working on it now, um, was probably one of the best, most liberating um, experiences as a researcher of my life. And for that, I have a lot of people to thank. Since I know I'm gonna run out of time, I'm gonna do it a little, little bit now. Um, I know that some of them are here today. Uh, I just wanted to give a special shout out to Jean um, for allowing me access to his data. And of course, to my PhD supervisor, Alain Brunet, for allowing me access to a graduate experience like none other that I've heard of, and uh, to Sylvia Carews, uh, who allowed me to hold on to the Zepsum project a little bit into my, my postdoc when I wasn't ready to kind of let go. And also just to, to everybody else, collaborators, um, host supervisors, we'll talk about a bit, advisors, mentors, colleagues, co-authors, the list goes on. Uh, and I wanna just again, officially uh, say thank you for organizing this event. I remember the knowledge transfer days uh, so many years ago and sitting around a big table with Douglas and talking about research and and it was just, uh, it's really, anyways, it's just wonderful excuse uh, for me to reread my own work. <laughs> it's been a while and, but also just to, to talk about things that I absolutely love doing. Um, also, unfortunately, I want to give a little trigger warning. <laughs> There's going to be some words on the screen. Uh, I do. I'm going to talk about trauma, so there. Anyway, there might be some things that are that are uncomfortable for some people. So I just wanted to give a little bit of a warning before before we get started. But again, thank you so much for having me. Um, okay, so as I said, um, we're going to take a, a trip back in time, <laughs> uh, specifically to 2015 because today uh, my presentation is a version of what I presented uh, back then for my thesis defense, which is hilarious, uh, with some minor modifications, obviously, and updates. Um, it's funny to look back on the slide specifically because the last version of this had all of these like little notes next to the manuscript titles saying like in progress and revise and resubmit, and accept it, you know what I mean? And it just seems like a lifetime ago that, that all of that kind of happened. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is I'm going to talk about PTSD back in 2015. Um, and so in that sense, I know that things have evolved in, in that kind of sense. But since I'm talking about papers from back then, I'm going to kind of keep with it, the terminology and the diagnoses that we were using back then and, and that kind of stuff. So just I, I, I recognize things have evolved since then, but I just wanted to, to you know, kind of, yeah, uh, mention that. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the context and rationale. I'm going to talk very briefly about the data because it's already been mentioned. Uh, a little bit about you know the the Zephyr project, and then I'm going to try to get through as many results as I possibly can in the allotted time that I have. So, um, with that in mind, we get started uh, with a little bit of information about um, post-traumatic stress disorder (PTSD). So back in 2015, uh, we were talking about the fact that it was a chronic debilitating condition as the direct result of a, of a, of a traumatic event. And um, that like carried a, a very significant burden. It still does, but I know that the terminology around these things have kind of changed a bit in terms of, you know, what, uh, the naming and all of that. Um, what's kind of interesting here is that uh, trauma, like what's on the screen right now is, is two classic examples of what people really think trauma is when you, when you ask them about trauma. And I'm going to talk a little bit about 
asking people about trauma. Um, but I looked at all different types of trauma and the Zepsin project was incredible for that in the sense that, that, that it wasn't just the ones that you see in the news. It was really many different types of trauma that we don't often think about uh, on kind of a daily basis. Um, and uh, at the time, um, the lifetime rates uh, were pretty varied, but in Canada, they were reporting a conditional rate of, I say very conditional rate of 9.2%. Uh, um, so in terms of the context and rationale for all of the research that I did uh, for my master's and PhD anyways, um, back in the day, the way that I justified everything was that uh, there wasn't really that much prevalence data, like data uh, when it came to, to these topics. Um, uh, and a lot of the data with post-traumatic stress disorder had been done with, like I kind of mentioned, specific types of trauma. Um, and uh, also a lot of it had been like recruitment by clinical settings uh, or using modified versions of the outcome variables of interests uh, that we're gonna kind of talk about. Um, so <laughs> realistically, what I'm saying is that my work was kind of an easy sell thanks to Zepsim, since it offered an opportunity to bridge all of these previous gaps um, within the literature with a community-based sample. They looked at the full trauma spectrum uh, the global and subscales for the things that I was interested in looking at, um, and and you know, anyways, more on that kind of later. But it 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 was yeah, a very easy sell, you could say, in that sense. Um, so uh, let's talk about my research, <laughs> uh, and to do that, you kind of have to go back to like the very very beginning, um, which. Uh, which maybe I'll just explain a little bit about, about how I learned about the Zepsin project during my time, during a time in my life when everything was kind of in upheaval. Um, the short version of the story is that I was changing directions and fields and supervisors. And I reached out to somebody I'd taken a class with, this Dr. Brunet. And I asked if he would take a master's student uh, in psychiatry at McGill. And the way I remember it is that he said, oh, fine, you can join my research team. He said, I have two projects, the first project, blah, blah, blah. I don't remember, honestly, I don't remember what it was. And he said, the second project is, um, this is other data set and we've looked at it a bit. And I remember he said, nobody wants to work with this data specific to PTSD because there's something off about it. The PTSD rates, PTSD rates don't make sense. And he said, but I still, I, there's something there. It could be a gold mine. And I just remember I was hooked. I was like, okay. And then he said, oh, and I'm going on sabbatical this year. <laughs> and I didn't realize that at the time, but it meant he wasn't gonna be around for any of my masters <laughs> because this was like the days before Zoom. And anyways, um, in a way though, all of these things that happened were kind of an unexpected bonus because he would leave me, he would leave me to go on his sabbatical, but he would leave me in his place as a representative um, on certain meetings for Zepsim. And it meant I got to sit at the big table of researchers for Zepsim, uh, which I remember was like very overwhelming as a, as a master's student who had no idea what she was doing. Uh, but it, in a way it also kind of inadvertently changed the course of my life. And I'll, I'll get into a little bit of how that happened afterwards. Um, in terms of the actual master's thesis findings, um, when Elaine said he was leaving, I made a bold, bold claim, I said, You'll be back in a year. Great, I'll be done. The very short version is is that uh, I was. <laughs> I, I I handed him something when, when I got back. I don't know how good it was. We worked on it a lot afterwards to to get the publication out. Um, but in general, uh, I focused on the first wave of data. Um, I found that in the end, it wasn't actually the PTSD rates that were off. It was the trauma rates. They were around 47%, uh, which is low compared to what we usually expect to find around 75% or higher. And lifetime PT rate, PTSD rates were also low, but this was because of the low trauma rates. And, and in the end, I'll kind of prove that I was right about this. Uh, but you could see that I, it was correct because if you looked at the conditional rates, which is individuals with PTSD, out of those who had experienced trauma, the rates were about 8%, which is, which is, which is why I was able to publish this data uh, because people would have been very skeptical had the rates been you know, very, that much lower. 
Um, the meat of my master's though focused on uh, quality of life and, uh, and social support. Um, I found in general that some, some unsurprising things, <laughs> I guess, for this, which is that if you have current PTSD or past 12 months uh, diagnosis of PTSD, you had poor quality of life. Not, not too shocking. Uh, individuals with uh, remitted PTSD, though, like so, who who had had PTSD and, and didn't anymore, um, or weren't at the were, weren't you know at the threshold anymore, had better quality of life than those who were were currently suffering. So again, not not surprising, but a good thing. It, it means you know you can come out of it. Uh, remitted and resilient, so trauma with with uh, with no PTSD. Um, those groups dem demonstrated no no differences in global scores. And I went a step further though, and I looked at uh, subscales for quality of life. And for the subscales, in general, everything was the same as the overall scales, except that with personal relationships, there was no difference between current and remitted uh, groups. So in personal relationships, they didn't seem to improve over time as you became, went into remission. Um, and so there's this hypothesis that potentially the relationships could be damaged and that had a lasting effect on, on an individual's quality of life, which makes things sense if you kind of think about it in terms of, of couples and, and the potential that, that uh, PTSD can, can have in terms of wreaking havoc on a relationship. Um, this, so this again, like wasn't like very surprising, um, but, but was interesting. What was most surprising was that the, the significance of statistically insignificant results, which I love saying, um, that were found for the subscale for housing and neighborhood. And pretty much uh, what we found there was that, was that there was no difference between current and remitted either. And so there was also something going on with housing and neighborhoods. And for me, that was kind of something that I, that I wanted to look at, at further. Um, and you'll see why <laughs> in a little bit. So my master's thesis, this, uh, if we're going to go back to the story, what's important to know is that everything that happened next, so the, the other results that I'll talk about, all of that happened because of my master's experience and builds on the findings from, from there. So first, when I, when I joined Atlantis Lab, I was very clear I was not doing a PhD. And he said, oh, we'll apply. Nobody gets it your first round anyways. You, if you ever decide to come back and do a PhD, you'll, you can reapply and you'll know what you need to work on in terms of your CV. So I applied. And I don't know what happened. I, I don't know if I was, it was a very great day. The reviewer must have gotten amazing news, um, but I, I, I did manage to get my CHR for my PhD. And then Elaine joked like, oh, remember how you said you'd just turn it down? Well, like it's a free degree, so just do it. <laughs> anyway, so so I, I said, okay, fine. Um, I, I was really lucky though, because he was right. Like it, it, it was such a good choice to stay, but also it gave me a lot of freedom as a graduate student um, because I got to kind of choose where I'd go. Like I had proposed something to CIHR that was like a very uh, broad idea. I had said that I would look longitudinally at my, you know, my quality of life data. And, and I did do that, but beyond that, I kind of got to choose. And second, so the second thing is uh, that, as I mentioned during the year that Elaine was on sabbatical, I got to set these interesting meetings on his behalf. And, and at one of the, at one of the meetings, um, there was a research, somebody from the research, a research team who had moved their research team to South Australia. And I thought, well, that's a nice place to spend Canadian winters. Uh, so that person was Mark Daniel. And, um, and when you know it, he worked with neighborhood. Another look at that and, and get more training in, in that kind of aspect. And then the third thing is those, those pesky trauma rates, um, those low numbers that didn't make sense. Uh, having spent a year immersed in that data and trying to get Iowa to explain to me how this could have happened, I had some ideas and I, and I wanted to test them. And I went to Jean, he was really open and receptive to that. Um, and so I made some changes uh, to the, the way the questions were asked. And, and so we'll talk about that in a second. So. You know all of this, so I'm not gonna go into it, but these are some of the waves and, and that I kind of looked at over the course of it. Um, but you know, this, you, you know, you know, kind of the, the stats for this. Um, 
I, I just want to show this because I know you already showed a, a photo, but we, we did this cool mapping over the course of my, my PhD. So this is a map of the Zepsum area broken down with the four trauma and PTSD categories that I mentioned. Um, and we did it at some point, um, nothing came of it, but every time I gave a presentation, I put it up on my slides for the entirety of my graduate study. So I thought I'd, I'd show it one last time. Uh, and uh, just in terms of the PTSD diagnosis that we were, we were using back in the day, we were using the, the one from the community, Canadian Community Health Survey. Um, and uh, the, what's interesting about it was that we were able to get these different groups. So there was a, a group that had not experienced trauma, a group that experienced trauma, but had not had PTSD, we called resilient. And then we had lifetime PTSD diagnosis, um, which included our current, so past 12 people, people who had it uh, diagnosed with the last 12 months and then remitted, so lifetime, but no, no past 12 months. Um, so that's some details just to, but realistically we're here to talk about results. So the first paper for my PhD examined issues of the, the low rates, like I said, um, we don't have a lot of time, thanks to all of my reminiscing, uh, but, but I did want to like do this next exercise because I think it's kind of interesting and I, I did it at my defense. And so pretty much what I did was I asked uh, people if they could just take a second, take a couple, a couple seconds to reflect on, on this question. Um, over the course of your life, have you ever experienced or witnessed a traumatic event that included threatened or actual death, serious injury, or another kind of threat to your physical integrity or that of others? And then I, the next thing that I kind of asked is, is now take another minute and reflect on how you might answer that same question, um, but in terms of, have you ever experienced any of these events? And um, then I kind of would ask in general, when I was giving these presentations, uh, if there was any differences um, in how you responded to the first question uh, compared to the second one. And the first paper of my, my PhD examined how reporting of trauma exposure changes based on um, how we, we ask about it pretty much. So, um, I had this, I'd had this thought when re I was rereading the questions over and over, um, they had used a screener for the first wave of Zepson and, uh, and it pretty much asked that, uh, a variation of that, that first question that I asked you to think about. And so for the second wave, I asked them to keep the screener, but then after, and this was a hard sell for them because it was adding more time, afterwards, regardless of what the individual said, give them the list and, and re-ask the question. And in general, we found that there was a significant 28% increase um, in reported trauma exposure between the single question and the, the list versions. And then um, the difference was significant for both genders, but more pronounced with women. And I don't have the chat open. Four minutes, okay. That's probably a while ago too, I'm in trouble. Um, anyway, so um, the, the biggest thing that you need to know is that, is that when we looked at it uh, with gender and age, we found that young men seem to kind of know like whether or not they'd experienced trauma. Young women um, often wouldn't recognize it if you just asked them the first question. Um, so, in general, uh, people also wanted to know the effects on PTSD diagnosis. So uh, we had a 15% increase uh, single to list uh, for non-conditional, 10% increase for, for uh, the conditional rates. Um, but what I found was really interesting is that 53% is that of the participants who said no to the single question um, reported trauma uh, like with the list and 13% and of them met the lifetime diagnosis for PTSD and all of those individuals were women. Um, and we'll just skip this one, we don't have any time. This is in general the summary, but literally my notes underneath it say, well, we don't have time for this, so <laughs> we're gonna go over it. But it, it just, it was kind of interesting and it, it kind of answered my question. The, the second uh, paper is, um, is the paper that I did when I was working in, in Australia. And it really focused on, um, um, on this idea of neighborhoods and post-traumatic stress disorder, trauma, and PTSD. Um, and uh, specifically, I looked at neighborhood disorder, so these visible cues indicating lack and social control of, of neighborhoods and willingness of residents uh, 
to, to recognize common values, to intervene is this idea of social cohesion. Both things that I would think are, would be incredibly interesting to look at, uh, and I'm sure somebody is uh, because of COVID, because both have kind of changed drastically, I'm sure. So this is the, the theoretical idea that we kind of had was that neighborhood disorder and social cohesion might impact PTSD in three ways uh, by influencing an individual's number and severity of, of traumatic events, pre-morbid vulnerability for developing PTSD and also prognosis. And what we found was that the association between trauma exposure and uh, perceived neighborhood disorder remains statistically significant after accounting for perceived cohesion and objective neighborhood socioeconomic deprivation. And these are kind of the, the changes that we had. And then uh, we also looked at everything kind of together. And pretty much what we found was that uh, perceived social cohesion, we lost our, our significance we put everything together, um, but uh, the relationship with neighborhood disorder stayed strong. So it was, it was kind of interesting. And then we, we also uh, confirmed by a path analysis that neighborhood disorder uh, mediates the effect of, of social cohesion in this, in this relationship. In terms of PTSD, um, among participants who had, who had experienced trauma, um, one standard deviation increase in social cohesion was associated with 37% lower odds of having current PTSD. Social cohesion, again, a good thing. Uh, this association remained stable pretty much uh, no matter what we threw at it. And uh, the same thing for neighborhood disorder, higher neighborhood disorder, higher rates of, of lifetime PTSD. And higher social cohesion was also related to greater odds of remission. Um, Again, the biggest thing for the highlights is just that for me, it was the importance of looking beyond just the individual and, and looking at where an individual lives that might, you know, um, factor into to how we, we look at trauma and, and PTSD. The last paper that I'm going to go over very, very quickly is um, the paper that, that we, we wanted to look at longitudinally, the same factors that we had looked at uh, um, for my master's, so the cross-sectional data. And uh, this image is like the model that we ran. It looks really fancy, but realistically, this is actually what it looks like. <laughs> it's like base form. <laughs> um, and so we looked at the first and second wave of, of Zepsum data. And I was interested in the direct uh, relationships and indirect relationships of different variables on, on quality of life uh, over time. And um, in terms of the results, we found overall that the effect of current PTSD on quality of life did endure with time. And we found again, some interesting things with housing and neighborhoods, but you know, that kind of lead me to, to believe that we need to continue to look at those factors. Um, but yeah, generally um, it, just, it just shows that these, these relationships over time do kind of persist and, and they're worth looking at. Uh, longitudinally, which steps and really allowed us to do in, in depth kind of way. And then uh, finally, um, this one's kind of out of left field, but uh, after I left, like I said, I, I did, uh, I brought the methods with me and I looked at neighborhood perceptions in a different field with, uh, with gambling outcomes. I don't have time to go into it though. So, <laughs> so you can find the paper, all of the papers online if you want. But again, um, I just want to say, you know, thank you so much for for having me here. There's so many people to acknowledge. Uh, some of them are here on the screen. And uh, I just, uh, yeah, thank you so much. I hope that this was a little bit interesting. And if people have questions, more than happy to discuss.